The science that actually is being reported can be manipulated. And I think to, to the common person that isn't knee deep in research, which is like most of us, you're not going to be looking at like, oh, did they compare the absolute risk or the relative risk? And they were looking at the outcomes, you know? And so when you have data manipulation, whether it's either manipulated to the point before it's published or whether it's manipulated when it's reported on the news or by some administrator somewhere, it's not exactly the whole story often. And so I think that's another layer to evidence-based medicine that, you know, would take some serious review. Um, and I think often what happens is you can imagine when companies put so much funding behind a, a product, could you imagine not getting the results that you want? Right. So then you have to sit, think, well, you know, maybe there might be some fudging <laughs> or manipulation or changing the way you're reporting just to make it look like a product is really better than it is. And that, that happens, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And it's happened in history. And, you know, like even opioids, that wasn't even like data fudging. They were literally saying like, this is not addictive, safe, you know? And so I think we just have to learn from history when we take risk benefit, you know, calculations into our head. Hey friends, welcome back. So on today's show, we catch up with Dr. Pharmacist Meg Kilsup to talk about why your health is not necessarily created through healthcare, but through your own nutrition, diet, exercise, lifestyle, stress reduction strategies, and choices. So your everyday choices really impact the trajectory of how you age and health. And so we talk about some of the unintended harm associated with common medications. Meg talks about some of the mechanism of action of various medications that are used, how they compromise uh, the microbiome, how to restore that naturally, how to support sleep naturally, uh, and how to optimize your health uh, naturally and much more. So Meg is an awesome person. Um, as a doctor pharmacist, she's actually done research for major organizations, major universities, and now decided to walk away from that career. She still does consulting, but she has three children under the age of 10. And they live a, a really outdoorsy life. She's a great person. Definitely check her out and follow her over on Instagram. Now, today's show is brought to you by Myoscience Nutrition, tools to support your micronutrient balance, sleep, energy, and much more. One of the things that has been popular amongst friends and family uh, this time of year especially is the new suite of chewable gummies that contain things like zinc, contain things like vitamin C and also vitamin D that your whole family will enjoy. So I would su su suggest you check them out over at myoscience.com. Our personal family favorite and something that we're getting a lot of good feedback over at Myoscience from is the new vitamin D gummies. These contain 1000 international units of vitamin D that your whole family will love. And so they're, they're taste great. They're like a nice treat. Instead of like putting a, a fruit roll up in your kid's camp or lunch pack, you can put a few gummies in there Guess, guess what? They're getting vitamin D and they're going to learn to like this and you can support your whole family's vitamin D levels by going over to myoscience.com. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. That's myoscience with an X.com. And you can click the banner there and look at the gummies and use the coupon code podcast at checkout. That's podcast over at myoscience to save on some new suite of formulas that the whole family will enjoy. So let's cut back to it with Meg Kilsup. Meg, really great to have you on the show. Good to meet in person. We've been friends on Instagram for a while. Yes. And before we get into your background as a pharmacist and all that, I just want to say I really admire your lifestyle at, that you and the tools that you teach your kids. Like you le lived in a van, a camper, and <laughs> with three kids, like you're a professional yeah. and all that, and you traveled around the country. You're in Montana all the time. What was that like? You know, we, well, we love being in the van, being outside. In Montana, the sky's there, as you know. It's like open skies, hiking all the time. Yeah, just to sleep in that open air. Like That's you cool. open the doors and you just wake up. Yeah. That is neat. There's nothing like it. That is So your job situation in Seattle changed and yeah. the whole COVID thing, schools were all virtual and you're like, all right, yeah. what are we going to do? Let's go cruise and be outside. You guys were hiking, camping, doing all that. Yeah. Did you have any bear encounters in Montana by chance? No, no. Not, not last time. We had a ton of bear encounters up in Jasper, Canada a couple mm. of summers ago, but... It's, I'm actually okay with the less berry colors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're kind of fun. Like we, we were in, in Glacier uh, a couple weeks ago and we had quite a few bear encounters and it was in, really interesting to see how people behaved with their bear spray because <laughs> they all think that like this little can of bear spray that's going to last about 10 seconds totally. is going to totally protect them and mama bears <laughs> running down the trail. It was really interesting. Oh um, 
So did you, what did you do? Did you rent the van? Did you buy the van? Like how did? Yeah, we bought the van, oh my gosh, I think four years ago. And then my husband, Rob, built, we have double layer beds in it. And then he put in like a refrigerator, little kitchen sink set up, cabinet, wow. so we can put all our gear and tools. So that yeah. That's neat. The van life. I've yeah. watched a few of those videos. It seems pretty like a cool thing to do. Yeah. Um, that's great. So we'll, we'll get into all that and then your hiking background and everything. But first let's talk about some of the health stuff. So you're a registered pharmacist. Mm -hmm. um, what, and you're now into all things natural health and exercise and diet, nutrition and all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people that go through professional training such as you um, are very mm -hmm. sort of doubtful of uh, the the actual benefits of natural living right they're skeptical right. due to their training right what were you naturally always into health or was it something like when did you get red pilled was it during school was it when you were actually working as a pharmacist yeah so definitely wasn't during school i mean when i was in school i was just literally absorbing every single thing memorizing and believing everything just point blank yeah and I was a healthy person at that time. I was, you know, running races, doing triathlons. But I, in my mind, everything that I was taught was a fact. And the way that it, the way that we should be, and that patients, if they have any sign of illness, then they need this medication, and then they need to be adherent. And that was my job as a pharmacist, you know, diagnosis, and then prescription, you know, prescription, and then I'm here to help them stay on track. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, it took a few years of me realizing. I get email after email after email from the FDA or from this pharmacy association like, oh, this pill was recalled. It turns out this actually can cause cancer now, this, you know, acid reducer that everyone's taking, oopsies, or Lipitor has this side effect or you name it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, so these drugs actually are supposed to be helping people, but actually turns out they're actually hurting a lot of people along the way. And so over the years, I kind of just saw this playing out. And I, the answer was always, always most of the time pills. Mm. Um, and, and most of the time people weren't getting better. And you see patients get a pill for their pill because they have a new side effect. And then they they go from three medications to six medications. And then, you know, rather than lifestyle as an option to, to truly heal or to figure out like why the diagnosis, it was just more medications. And so, you know, after kind of witnessing all this and I was always worked at a systems level, I never worked in a pharmacy. Um, and I just, I couldn't. <laughs> and at a system level too, it was so broken. And so you would see patients not getting healed on tons of medications. And then on a system level, there's so many errors that happen. There's so many, you know, broken lanes, lots of miscommunication, tons of well-intentioned people, mm -hmm. highly broken system. And so a lot of my career actually dedicated to that. But I noticed in both patient care and in the system, the root, getting to the root cause of whatever was causing the problem was the answer and it wasn't happening. And so for me personally, you know, after being in meetings with some, some of the top doctors, some amazing people, a well-intentioned people, and people are honest. They're like, yeah, this, it's not working, but we can't change it. And so it, it got pretty defeating. You know, you do what you can where you are, you, you bloom where you're planted, but where I was planted, I, I felt like I couldn't bloom anymore. Like my impact was hitting so many walls. And so I just decided I wanted to help people realize that, yeah, there's a place for medica medication, um, but how can we create health and life every day with like simple choices that don't have side bad effects, side effects? They yeah. actually have amazing side effects. Like the, the side effects of lifestyle, working out, eating well are awesome. So mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of side benefits that translate into so many different facets of life. Yeah. Uh, a lot of things that I would like to pick apart there, but first uh, because we're coming off an election and all that, there, a big topic now is access to healthcare. Right. Like that's the pro the problem with the healthcare system is not that it's so inefficient, like you just alluded to, or the fact that the left hand doesn't talk to the right hand, right. and the specialist from you know the cardiologist doesn't speak to the neurologist, doesn't speak to the gastroenterologist. Like forget all that. We just need more access. What would you say to that after having seen? Right. All of the inefficiencies right. and communication issues. What do you say to that argument? And how do you feel about this access is the problem? Right. Kind of well, I would say healthcare in itself, like like I said, there are some great intentioned people and it saves many lives. You know, I had a buddy just went to the ER, had his shoulder fixed, like Western medicine. We need it sometimes, right? Yeah. But it also actually kills many people. It's the third leading cause of death. Just Can I pause you right there? So yeah. when I look at the CDC's the morbidity, mortality, weekly report and stuff like that, yeah. 
they don't list iatrogenesis or they used to, they might've oh, moved it. Wow. So I remember always like reading that and hearing about yeah. I- iatrogenesis, like medical induced harm, which yes. accidents happen, whatever. Yes. But curiously, yeah. I'm not seeing that as much anymore. Have you seen that recently? Like it's kind of funny and the new reports are not showing that. Well, I haven't looked at the website for that recently. That was one of the leading points in a book that came out years ago called To Air is Human. Mm. And it's really just about how the medical system is full of error, unfortunately. And so we, many times people do need it, but also many times people get harmed. Yeah. And so I would, I would say that, yeah, I mean, you do need a certain degree of access to healthcare. I mean, especially emergency situations. But when we're talking about health, when we're talking about feeling well, you know, just living life fully, that, that is not created by healthcare. That is created with the choices that we make every day. And so I think when it comes to like what we're going to tell people, I don't think access to healthcare is the problem. I think the problem is that we don't have a society. We don't have a healthcare system. We don't have media. We don't have administration that is actually teaching people how to be healthy and making that the priority. It's like, how do we, let's empower everyone to not need healthcare, right? right? I mean, that's, that's the ultimate goal. Like have it there when we need it, you know, run labs when you need it, get into the bio-individual details, get in, yeah, I mean, prevention is important, but prevention isn't just a lab test. Prevention is going outside, you know, doing whatever movement feels good to you, eating real food that, like, actually came from the earth or an animal, you know. Um, So, yeah. That's awesome. I I love that idea. Um, That'd be a hard thing to sell to people, like, we need to make everyone so healthy so they don't need healthcare. And what's, <laughs> what comes up is I shared this, you know, on one of our like YouTube videos and, and Instagram is when the owner of whole, the CEO of whole foods, which his name is escaping me right now. If you know, let me know. Um, <laughs> I don't think he, so. he, he was in an interview and saying that the reason why America's healthcare system in short, I'm summarizing what he yeah. said is such a disaster is because people eat unhealthy foods. And, and he said exactly what you said in different words that our goal should be making it so that people don't need this. Yeah. And he was just shredded online. I don't know if you saw the story. I like see that. on Twitter, people are like, oh my gosh, he's saying <laughs> that real food can, per- I, if I eat real food, I won't have to take this anxiety medicine or I won't right. have to take this digestive aid or whatever. And w- the arguments, the flawed logic there was, was linking uh, preventative health with the prevention of acute illnesses, like saying, oh, I'll just eat broccoli so I don't have to get right. a cast from my broken arm. Right. So you're you're really, so maybe we can put into a box right now, acute care versus chronic care. Exactly. And this is where, you know, healthcare shines in one, but not the other area, right? Yes, exactly. And I think that, I mean, 100%, like if, if literally we had, if everyone couldn't eat food made in factories for like five years, could you imagine the health of all of us? I mean, what the way I think of it is, is most people are eating synthetic chemicals for their food, for what they're putting in their body. And it's actually not food. It's not fuel. It's chemicals. And then that creates illness. It creates dis, like disease or dis-ease in the body. And then because of that illness, then we take more synthetic ke- chemicals to, you know, help the body, <laughs> uh, quotes. And so... You can, un- you can see the vicious cycle of that, right? And then on top of the what you're treating people with, then you have all these new side effects. So just to even touch on what you said about real food and anxiety, mm-hmm. so people kind of mocking that statement, like, oh, okay, well. But the thing is, is that when you eat, you know, food that isn't food, you can wreck your gut, your gut. And that actually can totally disrupt your mood, your emotions, your hormones. I mean, so much, how you're absorbing... All, like everything. And so truly what we eat can impact so many areas of our life besides like, you know, your weight or your blood pressure. And so I think it's so much more complex. And at the same time, it's also so simple. <laughs> but like you kind of touched on is it's it's not a money maker to to point people to just to eating well and to, to get off all their meds, right? Like that's not that's not making money. And ironically too, doctors are incentivize there's something called a quality incentive where if their patients get better within a certain time frame they get rewarded and like that makes sense right you're like well that's exactly what we want we want patients to get better so we're going to reward doctors um, based on that but unfortunately if you really think about it that i think that drives a quick fix because mm. it's going to take 
you know, Sally six months to maybe get her blood pressure down naturally. But if you give her that pill, she could get it down in a month and then you can put that in your electronic medical record. So, you know, it's like, there's a lot, there's so much good intentions, but it's, it's so layered, <laughs> all of it. It's complex, but you're right. So it may not, there may not be these big dollars um, that can be captured from making people super healthy. But at the same time, there's big dollars being lost when it comes to loss of productivity, sick days. Mm. Look at this pandemic that disproportionately yes. affected people. Polypharmacy, multiple medications, at least mm. per a US, uh, I'm sorry, UK biobank study found that that was a risk factor for disease severity and so forth. So right. the more medications you're on, the more likely you will yep. be to die or to need medicalization or to right. be hospitalized, right? right. So you like that that doesn't really bode well with this whole access is the problem argument so it, it what i'm the point that i'm getting at mm -hmm. here is the reinsurers of the insurers so the the insurance companies united aetna premier and all that right. they're going to become bankrupt because it's so expensive. So yes. the reinsurers are saying, hey, Aetna, like you better figure this lifestyle medicine stuff out because we don't know if we can insure you. So that's where they're actually yeah. driving, you know, some of this change, which would be pretty cool to right. see because like you said, you know, we, and one of the questions that I had for you, I didn't want to interrupt is like, and it, it goes into what I was just saying with this, where do you think the problem is when it, and what I mean by this is, um, like let's pick on Sally Smith who thinks that her anxiety is not caused by her, her diet. She needs the pill to cure the anxiety. Is it the physician's problem or the mindset of the patient, right? Because people think you go to the doctor, you have a digestive tummy ache, you need this pill. You're depressed, you need this one. Is it the doctor or is it the patient that doesn't want to make the change? Right. Like who's the, like if you could point at the crux of the problem or is it a little bit of both? Because yeah, I think it's kind of a joint yeah. impact there. And I think that it's, definitely like which came first the chicken or the egg also a vicious cycle situation because doctors do have a lot of power in their words and in their statements so when a patient goes to see the doctor they are they're really looking to hear what they have to say right like to to most people the the doctor is the expert right and so if the doctor is like well you need this this is the answer most patients are gonna agree you know just go with it yeah and you know it's easy you don't have to change anything you pick it up at the pharmacy you know there's that but i think also just in general in society we all have a problem with just fixing everything quickly including myself like mm. if my amazon shipping is going to take four days instead of one, two days i'm just like well why i'm clicking around i'm like you can't make it come faster <laughs> amazon you know yeah. and so i think that just in general no matter who you are we've just ad adapted to that lifestyle where literally you just want answers now and you want it fixed now mm. And I think that health, these things, whether, and anxiety could come from so many, so many issues, right? It could be food, it could be hormones, it could be, there's a lot. It could be just even a situation going on in your life, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's Bad many factors. Sleep, something like that. Totally. Yeah. Um, and so I think that we all are so unique and bio-individual and something that I struggle with in the doctor-patient relationship is sometimes they're just like blanket recommendations. It's not like, okay, well, Sally, let's talk about let's get into your lab. Let's, let's look at some different tests. Let's look at heavy metal toxicity. I mean, there's things that don't even come up on the radar gut health. I mean, I was in pharmacy school four years, got a doctorate of pharmacy. I never once heard the phrase gut health or so much. I know now that I never knew to, to think about, um, when it comes to people's health and their symptoms and what they're dealing with. And so, yeah, I think it's kind of like, you know, a word that is really common in healthcare. It's, it's called patient centered care. And I think that most doctors have that intention. You know, they want to put, the, well, what do you want, Sally? And Sally's like, well, I don't know, whatever you tell me. <laughs> and so I think it can kind of be that back and forth thing. But I think, unfortunately, when you have a 15-minute window and most docs aren't running labs, they're not looking at thinking about diet, they're not thinking about lifestyle, it just it ends up being that quick fix. Mm -hmm. And then people become dependent upon it. They yeah. get some benefit. Yeah. Um, the placebo effect is really strong. I mean, if we think about you know, so the whole class of SSRIs and SNRIs and so forth and, and some of the details of the, the, yes. of the studies and so forth. Um, it, it's really interesting to look at, you know, the data, uh, you know, yeah. maybe not, they may not be as efficacious as, as people think they are, but the yes. placebo effect is even very strong. Right. And I've noticed that myself um, mm -hmm. with different drugs and compounds over the years. Like, you know, if you believe it's going to work, mm -hmm. It really, like the mind, and for some reason in medicine, why do you think this is where even in drugs, we want to control and isolate that and we don't want the placebo to do anything. But I think, why not exploit the placebo effect? Like, <laughs> why, might as point. well. 
and pick know? a placebo that like isn't going to hurt you. Yeah. You know, like totally. I think you're, that's a good example of the antidepressants. Um, and you know, ironically, I was thinking about this morning. I mean, those drugs can even increase risk of suicide. And so yeah. there's so much at play when it comes to, to medications. But on that note, there are some studies that show that just working out is, can be as efficacious as antidepressants. Wow. And so lifestyle, I mean, truly, truly can be so life-changing. And then, by the way, when you're working out, you're getting your vitamin D, maybe you're on a run, you're getting your fresh air, you're lowering your blood pressure, doing what, uh, whatever else you need to do, just living your life how you should, and you're not getting the negative side effects. But yeah. That's a really, really important point. Um, you mentioned gut health. Now, when did you graduate from pharmacy school? Just so I have context. Yeah, 2009. Okay, so it was so. right around, I mean, gut health was still being talked about in the literature then, but the microbiome project didn't start until 2012. So mm -hmm. I could maybe see how that maybe didn't get infused into the curriculum. Yeah. But what I wanted to ask you is like, what are the top prescribed medications? Like, isn't it PPIs, like a, a number one? PPIs, um, antibiotics, of course. Um, steroids, hmm. hormones. So the pill, which is what tons and tons of women are on. And so when you have extra estrogen can totally, um, cause hyperpermeability in that intestinal lining. Wow. And so just for our, you know, listeners gut health, when we talk about what damages it, it could, you can damage your gut in a variety of ways. So antibiotics, for example, you're wiping out all the bacteria in your gut. It's not, they're not selectively choosing the one that's causing you to be sick, obviously. And so by wiping out the pathogenic and the commensal. And when you do that, your the bacteria, the good bacteria that lives there is actually what is generating your immune system. <laughs> and it's so, so important. Your immune system lives like it's 80% of it in your gut or something. And so it's kind of ironic that you like wipe that out <laughs> when you're sick. So anyways, antibiotics destroy the gut that way because then you have to rebuild and it can be all, it's called dysbiosis. And then you can get a leaky gut because when you're the good and the bad all get wiped out, you can have kind of just the bad bacteria takeover or fungi, whatever. And then it pokes holes into the intestinal lining. And then when that happens, new, uh, like things that shouldn't get across that wall do. So you can think of like a coffee filter and then you have, you know, things that should cross it. You want your food nutrients to cross the gut lining, but you don't want um, food particles that shouldn't cross it and then cause allergies, autoimmunity, so much stuff. So anyways, antibiotics wreck your gut that way. Um, PPIs, they totally obviously reduce the stomach acid. And so you can imagine we need that stomach acid. And now it, we even know that they can cause stomach cancer. So mm. um, yeah. Is that new? I, didn't, I haven't heard that before. Yes. Uh, wow. That's, gosh, a year or two ago. Crazy. So Zantac actually got pulled off temporarily at least because it had a cancer causing contaminant in it. And then PPIs, they reported, yeah, I forget how long ago that was, but um, increased risk of stomach cancer. Jeez. And so, I mean, if you think about it, you're not really supposed to reduce your stomach acid for that long. It's supposed and, to be temporary, right? Yeah. And like you have, a, you have an ulcer, okay, yes. here's this thing, yeah. and then we'll let the ulcer fix and whatever. Yes. So it's kind of like people, like you say, you get comfortable with something. And then if you don't have to change your diet and you have reflux, you can just take the pill, but still eat the fried chicken or whatever that gives you the reflex. <laughs> it's like, it seems like a win-win scenario, but it's actually not. That is super crazy and, yeah. and really scary. And the changes in the micro, I mean, if we just talk about, like you mentioned all the, the great ways or the, the bad ways, but the, how you explain it in an eloquent way. Um, but, but having hydrochloric acid is another deleterious factor for the dysbiosis that you alluded to and the permeability because you need, you know, stomach acid north mm -hmm. in to make more of a alkaline environment further south in the small intestine. And if you don't have those changes, then you don't have the proper motility and hormones and all that. Right. So yeah, you can see how just shutting off one little yes. faucet yes. can have this downstream deleterious effect. Yes. And especially if you're on it forever. And I've had several clients over yes. the years who have been on a PPI for a little bit of visceral fat or, and or sleep apnea, mouth uh, breathing and so mm -hmm. forth while they sleep. And then that led to all these other issues mm -hmm. and joint pain and, and just mm -hmm. like they finally figured it out. But it was like, why did it take you five years right. to then make the call to me or the email to like want to talk about this? Like what, what you know, I'm sure yeah. at some point you realized like I'm robbing Peter to pay Paul here. Right. So I don't know. That's why we right. have these conversations to hopefully inspire yes. other people to go, you know what, maybe I shouldn't be, right. be doing that. Um, well, and I think even as a pharmacist, you kind of, we all think of medications as like, well, we, you take this for depression, you take this for your stomach, you take this for that. 
But when you put that chemical into your body, these aren't even really side effects. To me, they're more like expected effects of what that is going to do to every body system. <laughs> and so, you know, same thing with antibiotics, but antibiotics is just so obvious. Mm -hmm. um, but all these other medications that we take, any medication is going to cause a downstream effect. So you have that in any human body, and then you layer on top of that that we're all bio-individuals. So some people might get stomach cancer and some might not, but yeah. We're not all the same? No, it's Gosh, crazy. that is <laughs> wild. No, I'm just kidding. Um, super fascinating stuff. So does the name Nigel Plummer ring a bell? Mm -hmm. he, he has worked a lot in the realm of probiotics and so oh, forth okay. out of the UK. And one of the things that he was recommending back as early as 2007 was if you need to take an antibiotic, because unfortunately that might happen. It's yeah. like your buddy who happened broke his, yeah, it happened to me. I infected my foot in Hawaii, actually stepping on a sea urchin that I ignored. <laughs> um, I cut my finger really, really bad. And thankfully that didn't get infected, but, um, yeah, it's funny. The feet get really infected. Like if you get a laceration that, oh, that gets, man. it's crazy. Cause it's so distal, so far yes. away from your heart and everything. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, so this is what I did. And I want to just kind of pick your brain a little bit for people listening uh, or watching that might have to go on an antibiotic. I took a probiotic uh, for four hours outside of that window. So mm -hmm. let's say I took the antibiotic in the morning. Um, I took the probiotic four hours later. Then I also took Saccharomyces boulardii, the probiotic yeast, mm -hmm. when, because that was unaffected by that. And studies out of the UK have shown for a long time that, that the antibiotic is more effective mm -hmm. at killing the infection and you produce less uh, uh, antibiotic-resistant bacteria, right? Mm. Have you seen uh, what has come out? I haven't been following this research for a while. This was a what, what, like, yeah. what would you recommend when you're on an antibiotic? Anything else? Yeah, you know, well, I actually had to take one last summer too. <laughs> yeah. um, and we were in the middle of Yellowstone. I got an infection and I didn't have access to it anything holistic we're in our van <laughs> mm -hmm. so anyways you know what happens and I always like to include that when I talk about these things with people because I think you and I both are trying to say there is a time for medications and like they're a great tool to have in our toolbox and sometimes you have to take it yep. um, and I've also treated an infection completely naturally and holistically and done it beautifully that way too um, but there's a time and place for everything so anyways when I had my um antibiotics last year I actually didn't have to take a probiotic that first week because we were just like traveling around Montana I was just like whatever but you know what I did do that I think can be just as effective I don't haven't looked into the research on this but there there is a lot of research on the general idea of it which is sugar feeds the bad bacteria and so what I did was I made a point to eat real foods and to nourish well because as you're taking the antibiotic your microbiome is just getting wrecked and messed up and it's trying to rebuild the good and back to bad bacteria are like doing their thing down there and so for me I just really took care of my health just in general so I was taking the antibiotic but I was sleeping well I was exercising I was minimizing sugar and eating real foods and eating prebiotic foods and these prebiotic foods that you can eat which is pretty much real food <laughs> um we I could list certain vegetables there's that but to make it less complicated if you eat real food it helps the good bacteria grow. So you're not only just minimizing the growth of the bad bacteria, you're helping certain strains of really, really good bacteria grow. And what's cool about that is anyone can access real food in, in a pickle like me when you're like at Old Faithful, you know, clinic. Um, they didn't have the probiotic that I wanted and not all probiotics are created equal. And it, studies actually show that lots of them are dead by the time you get it in your mouth. So you know, maybe it's placebo effect. <laughs> um, but I think some of them obviously can be very beneficial, but I just, I love that example and it worked for me and I didn't have any, I would not even have known that I was on antibiotics. Mm -hmm. I didn't have stomach ache. I didn't have rash. I didn't have any sort of issue. And I'm thinking it's because of how I was nourishing my gut just with the choices I was making. That's so, awesome. Yeah. I mean, you could, you could replace antibiotic in that context with immunization with anything, right? Because the more healthy you are, the greater the effect of an antibiotic will be and less downside it would be. And same with immunization, which is, we can talk about that a little bit later, but I'm disappointed that the media hasn't talked about that. Right. Like, yeah. oh, you just take this thing and you can go like, get eat a donut Perfect. and you're totally, totally fine. You're like, well, totally. the science yeah. doesn't really show that. But so <laughs> you, I was going to ask you, so you didn't have Cipro with you. You, you went to like a little clinic. Yeah. Okay. The old faithful emergency clinic. There you go. <laughs> so when I was in an undergrad doing biology, we were taught, like, if you get an antibiotic, you take the full course, no mm -hmm. matter what. Mm -hmm. I think the science has changed on has that. Changed. What, what do you do? Yeah. So now you're supposed to stop 
and this isn't for every single situation, so not medical advice, none of this is. <laughs> but um, once you don't have symptoms anymore, for most situations, you can stop taking the antibiotic. Mm -hmm. So it means that the drug's done its job, the bad bacteria that was causing your infection is no longer winning. <laughs> your immune system yep. is getting some control. Exactly, and so you're good. And so historically, it was like if you got a 14-day course, you just you finish that puppy or else you're going to be causing more antibiotic resistance in your gut. That was what the old science said. And now we know that's not the case. And there's actually, I did a lot of this work in my old job. So they're changing all the protocols, even to hospitals like post-surgery. It used to be like 14 days and now it's like maybe just one day or nothing. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually, I think it's a really big step because it's antibiotic huge. resistance is to me terrifying, um, even more than many other things going on in the world. Uh, because we're really creating this beast because we just chronically overuse antibiotics. And I think it's like 47 million antibiotic prescriptions a year. Oh my gosh, it's crazy. Yeah. And I, so. I definitely want to get back to dysbiosis and that thing you were hinting at a little bit later. Yeah. Because uh, I think that's that's quite fascinating. But so I followed that advice because I was like, dude, I remember learning this in like yeah. 2002. Like yeah. you take the antibiotic no matter what. And I'm like, my foot... It was two days and it was back. So I'm like, yeah. why do I need to continue yeah. to wreck my gut? It yeah. was Keflex that I was taking. And I went to like a little outpatient clinic, you know, uh, urgent care in Hawaii, you know, because yeah. it got so bad. I was getting the streaks coming up and everything. <laughs> and it was blood infection. It was totally gone yeah. after two days. So I'm like, I don't need to take this anymore. And a few of my buddies who I don't want to mention their names or anything because they're great people. They're like, I think you need to take it for the full thing. And I'm like, right. I, I wonder if that's still the case. And I yeah. came across a few different articles that said exactly what you said. And mm -hmm. I was like, dude, that's really cool. Yeah. And I was like, I wonder how many doctors who are so busy in their practices yeah. who didn't get this memo, who are still advising patients mm -hmm. to continue to do this. Mm -hmm. And you think about, okay, if you trash a microbiome for two days versus 14, <laughs> it's a big, big difference, difference, right? Yeah. So that's Absolutely. a huge, huge uh, take home tip and, and all of that. Yes. Um, yeah, it was pretty, pretty cool. I'm I mean, glad that it's okay. it was so bad. Like oh, I, I was not going to, to do anything because it was just like a little sea urchin and yeah. I'm like, I'm in the ocean. It's no big deal. Yeah. But I guess there's a lot of strep and staff yes, in I the heard ocean. The, yes. I, I heard was like, that. who would, it's the ocean. Like there's salt, like mm -hmm. what, but anyway, the, the, it, and the humidity and then you get out of the ocean and. You're, maybe it's also like the effects of tourists and vacationers like, oh, we're fine. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to miss a day. Right. No, no, no yeah. that's what it was. I continued to use it. <laughs> I didn't like nur nurture it like yeah. I probably should have. Yeah. But it was actually a really good lesson in that I learned that. Um, so interestingly, since we're on this topic, right after I took the antibiotics, guess what happened? I got COVID. So I got the bug. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I don't think yes. it was it was like. Uh, because my well, wife, your immune system was down and out. You exactly. Just took a couple shots to it, right? Wiped out your gut. So, yeah. So, yeah. So Deanna, who was not on the antibiotics and who's older than me, yes. was around the same group of wow. people where we had dinner and she like ba basically had a muscle ache for like a day, whereas wow. I was a little bit more sick. So anyway, this is totally anecdotal end of one, but it was interesting. But there's that, science behind what you're saying. Yeah. Because you, there's studies that show, but when you take antibiotics, you decrease the um, expression of immune cells. So Interesting. strand of one is validated. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of that, there is some data showing that there is a dysbiotic microbiome in the oral, mm. I'm sorry, oral and uh, lung epithelial tissue in people that have severe COVID. So is it the virus changing the ecological niche within right. that ecosystem or was the ecosystem screwed up beforehand, yes. which made it more of a hospitable habitat for the for the virus to take hold. I don't really know what's yeah. the chicken or the egg, but yeah. that was kind of interesting. It's so interesting. Yeah. And I think that a lot of providers were giving a Z pack mm. and some still are for part of the treatment. And I think that I was kind of scratching my head at first with that, especially because I dedicated so much time to like you use antibiotics for bacterial infections. Like right. that's what you use antibiotics for. And so at first that started happening, I started digging into it and it's because of what you're saying is there's something that's going on in the gut and in the microbiome that's making certain people more at risk and having more symptoms and problems with, with the virus. And when I what I would guess is that when you take the Z-Pak, they're wiping out whatever that bad bacteria is in the microbiome that's causing issues. And then the virus, I, I don't know if it's being a host of the virus or what, but definitely something's going on there. And so... Like, you know, I, I think, you know, we really only know so much. It's like we continue to learn more and more about this, but it's like, gosh, even whether it's that virus or just science or the world we live in or microbiome, I think we know like one one millionth of it. <laughs> yeah, but 
I, I totally agree with that. But I think the thing that we are learning and that is more kind of clear is yes. that lucid, if you want to say, yeah. is that our, our, these bugs crosstalk with our immune system. Yes. So if they're unhappy, then our immune system is going to be unhappy. And yes. I think that's kind of what you're oh, alluding absolutely. to. Eating real food and all of that. Mm -hmm. Like you're making the bugs that are there more happy so that your immune system, you know, can do its job. Yes. And so I think that's what's lost in the narrative about yes. how we live these pretty unhealthy lives yes. and how that unhealthy living translates Propagate. or is transmuted, yes. right, to the immune system. Well, absolutely. And I think I was kind of saying science, we're trying to put to words things that we kind of know to be true. Yeah. And I think this kind of even goes back to the basics, which is, we could put all these scientific words, we could do all these trials on the microbiome and this and that, but it's like when you live a healthier life and when you eat real food and when you take care of your body, your body is going to do a better job when it meets any pathogen, any pathogen out there. So I think something that, you know, we've both talked about on our platforms is wouldn't it have been awesome if the last year and a half people were actually empowered to take care of themselves, to, you know, how, this is how you eat better and, and this is how you prioritize working out and you know, et cetera, because, you know, obviously this isn't going anywhere right. <laughs> and obviously, you know, this, these things are going to keep happening, whether it's this or that. Right. And so it's such a huge opportunity and, you know, the outcomes could have been so different. A hundred percent because in our protective strategies, we made vulnerable people more vulnerable, which yep. is a, which is a shame. So yep. yeah, I'm with you. And, but it's been weird how the media has sort of created this like, uh, rebuttal to that narrative that like if you think like that then you must not care about me right. or, and it's like no no that's not what it's about no. we want to rise like high tides lift all boats yes. right we should all be more healthy yes. and then maybe this wouldn't have been such a problem so yes 100 with you and even if you're pro immunization and getting your shots and all that yeah. those are gonna be more effective if, if you so yeah, um, it's it's hard to argue with it, but some people just don't hear you because Dr. Fauci didn't say it or it wasn't right. said on the mainstream networks, which is like, right. just because they don't say that stuff, like it doesn't mean it's not real. Like, right. Well, and unfortunately there's so much financial bias. And so that was, you kind of asked about my red pill situation. Yeah, yeah. And I think something that I've learned over the year is I do think that evidence-based evidence medicine is obviously where it's at. You need to have evidence. But at the same time, there is an incredible amount of financial bias and corruption when it comes to what is published. And then not only what is published, but what is then aired. And so I think that we have to put that filter on. But, it, you know, it took me 10 years in the system to come to that conclusion. And so I think anyone out there, when you're watching the news, you're not really – all that isn't crossing <laughs> your your mind. You're not so, seeing, yeah. Like, well, uh, ivermectin is a good example of that, yes. right? This is a, an, it's an antiviral, is it? Yes, and it's often used as an antiparasitic mm. um, drug worldwide. It's actually, I think the, the WHO calls it an essential medication, and it's been used so much across the world. But yeah, antiparasitic, antiviral activity, anti-inflammatory activity. Sounds yeah. pretty applicable to <laughs> yeah. everything that's going on, but yeah. because it's off patent, um, it's hard to get funding to re repurpose an old drug to show that it does much of anything because of the fact that no one can make any money on it. Right. So that's right. an example of like, yeah. And it's, it's really unfortunate because with, with ivermectin, it's actually incredibly affordable too. So I think it's like three bucks for hundred pills of ivermectin or something, oh. you know, it's like, it's very accessible. It's already approved. Doctors can already prescribe it off label, I believe. So it doesn't have to go through, you know, all these hoops to get an emergency use, this or that. And studies have shown it to be effective. And there's even a meta-analysis, a systematic review, looking at that in patients. And so I think that that's a perfect example of something that evidence is there that this could save somebody's life or this could be, you know, at least it could be considered, even if it's not the guideline, like, the top recommendation, but just a consideration for a doctor to have with a patient. Hey, you're high risk. Do you want to take this as a prevention? Or, hey, you're really sick. This is an option. This, this is the outcomes we've seen. But that's, that's shoved away and it's, you know, said it's called dangerous. And that isn't even a new experimental drug that's been used safely for most people for a long time. And so that's where the phrase evidence-based medicine, even for me, can even feel like a trigger word because I'm like, well, there's so, so, so layered. It's not as simple as, you know, whatever 
JAMA published or whatever is said on TV because there's there's so many layers to it. Right. And, and there was a whole, the whole Lancet Gate thing, I think, with yes. hydroxychloroquine yes. and all of this. So these journals can be so biased mm-hmm. in their, in, and almost like, it's almost like religion, not science at that point. Yes. So people, yeah, I, I agree with you. Like it's, it doesn't mean any more, mean much to me anymore when people say, oh, it's following the science or evidence-based. You're right. like, okay, well, what science, what evidence? Like, um, yeah, like there is a lot of financial, even when it comes to supplements too, this actually happens because I have a supplement business and I've been in the space since 2006. You see this with raw ingredients, for example, yeah. uh, NMN or NR, some of those, I don't want to pick on any brand names, but uh, you'll see that where one company will have an exclusive distribution rights on something and then they're self-publishing all the research and their product is like a hundred dollars a month and so it's it's one of those things where you can certainly see the intellectual property does drive the pricing and the exclusivity but what's curious about that is a lot of people fall for that and don't ask the questions and they're all getting on the latest and greatest because of the science and you know so it's it's helpful to always look at okay who's funding the research You know, what is it really doing? All and of what's, that. And what's being published too. So there's publication bias, but like the, I mean, the science that actually is being reported can be manipulated. And I think to, <clears throat> to the common person that isn't knee deep in research, which is like most of us, mm-hmm. you're not going to be looking at like, oh, did they compare the absolute risk or the relative risk when they were looking at the outcomes, you know? And so when you have data manipulation, whether it's either manipulated to the point before it's published or whether it's manipulated when it's reported on the news or by some administrator somewhere, it's not exactly the whole story often. And so I think that's another layer to evidence-based medicine that, you know, would take some serious review. Um, And I think often what happens is you can imagine when companies put so much funding behind a a product, could you imagine not getting the results that you want? Right. So then you have to sit, think, well, you know, maybe there might be some fudging <laughs> or manipulation or changing the way you're reporting just to make it look like a product is really better than it is. And that, that happens, mm-hmm. unfortunately. And it's happened in history. And, you know, like even opioids, that wasn't even like data fudging. That was just, they were literally saying like, this is not addictive. This is safe. You know, and so I think we just have to learn from history when we take risk benefit you know, calculations into our head. That's huge. Um, do you want to dive into an, any more depth, absolute versus relative risk and what you look for and like for the average Joe who might know p-value of 0.01 and right. statistical significance, like how, um, what are some red flags, I guess you would say, where you might read a study about a certain drug or a compound or, or even yeah. an intervention and it says relative risk, but doesn't include absolute risk. Or Is yeah. there any like tips you can offer? Yeah. So, you know, typically you want to see both being reported. And so if they're only reporting absolute or relative, you would want to know both. And so, for example, let's say, you know, everyone in the world has a 0.05% chance to contract a certain virus. I'm just making up a percentage, (laughs) Um, you know, X virus. And half of those people take one, take a pill and the other half don't. And let's say, you know, like there's a 0.0003% benefit. (laughs) Um, I'm taking that tomorrow. Give me this thing. Yeah, right? And so your absolute risk and your relative risk are very different. But what is important to think about is your risk in the first place is so, 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 so low. And so when you start comparing those little numbers, you're going to get much larger changes or relative risk improvements or reductions um, versus just your absolute risk in the first place of, you know, catching whatever virus or whatever is going on. And so, yeah, I think it can, it can majorly change the story being told either, you know, it's like, well, your risk is really, really low, but this might help you like a smidge or like, oh, actually this, you know, that's one thing you could report, or you could also report this helped you. This is a 99%, you know, improvement, but it's like actually the risk was so low in the first place. And so I think that's what, you know, most people aren't even thinking of or aware of when you see a headline. Mm -hmm. And so I know actually Sean model who you've podcasted with and are friends with, he did an episode with a man who goes deep into this on, um, the, the immunization for COVID. And Mm -hmm. so I would say that if you want all the details head there. (laughs) Yeah, that was, that was a good interview for sure. And, and that dark horse podcast as well. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll put that in the show notes, uh, guys. Amazing stuff. Now, um, before I ask you this question, I just want to preface it that 
Um, and we're going to talk about this. Maybe we can talk about this now because I do want to ask about the derivation of drugs and how a lot of people kind of look at, oh, it's natural. It probably doesn't work, but there's a lot of drugs that are derived from natural compounds. Um, so let's get to that in a second, but first talk about, and maybe people can have inferred so far through our conversation, um, we're not anti-drug. You took an yes. antibiotic, I took an antibiotic. Yep. There's a place, a time and a place because in the natural product space or even in kind of the wellness space, a lot of people are like, ew, metformin, it's a drug. I don't want that. Where you're right. like, well, Actually, I mean, out of all the benign, relatively benign drugs, yeah. I'm not too worried about someone taking metformin just yeah. because it's prescription. Now, you wouldn't want to take it before you do a triathlon, right? But if you're, you have high fasting glucose and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So there's a time and a place for drugs. Yeah, having mm -hmm. the best of life through chemistry periodically. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think you made the point too that oftentimes these are just synthetic creations of what is, has been found in nature. And I think that's where a lot of it was discovered in the first place. And that's what our ancestors did for years, right? Um, and so I think that, like, it's like, is it slippery? Um, no. There's like a, yeah, like a bark. And I think they found that it can help with inflammation and blood. And, you know, I think it became aspirin. We should oh, double yeah, check the that. willow, the white willow yeah, bark. Willow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a little foggy in my he head, but that's just one example. And, I mean, you can even look at... I mean, there's so many examples. The statins, of it. the monoclin family, those yes. come from like get ready rice and all of that. Then yes, yes, there's so many, so many, and I think that you can see that too with natural products. And so something that I thought was interesting in pharmacy school is it was always like, well, prescribed drugs are safe and effective because they've been studied, and natural drug, natural ones are dangerous because they haven't been tested and approved by the FDA. And that was literally like the mantra that I absorbed. Mm -hmm. But what I found over time is that obviously these natural supplements that are called alternative, but really they were like the originals, these can be just as effective and they could also be just as dangerous if they're used incorrectly. And that's because they can be effective. <laughs> so you're, you're taking something that can really impact your life. Maybe you have a deficiency, maybe something's going on in your body. Maybe you, you know, need a blood thinner or whatever reason. So they can be so effective. And the reason that they can be dangerous, just like a prescription can, is because they can work. And I just think that's so cool. Mm -hmm. And and that's how our ancestors and that's how many people today still treat um, infections. And, and just to be uh, transparent, I guess I had a, a UTI last December and um, I used completely natural remedies. And I was in my head, I'm like, there's no way this is going to work, but yeah. I'm going to like try it, you know. And I kind of felt like a crazy person because I was like, you know, eating raw garlic and like essential oils and, um, you know, all the things that you take for a nat natural approach. And it totally worked. Wow. And I did like high dose vitamin C right when I got it. Um, I did the active form of cranberry juice, like in a pill that actually works, but within hours wow. I was better and I watched it for days and people were like, Oh my gosh, I should get a kidney infection. We're so worried about you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I actually, I feel amazing. And I just think it just goes to show you that what's out there in the natural arena can, can be effective and it can be, yeah, obviously it can be harmful. Like, I mean, if you swallow a whole bottle of ibuprofen, it's going to be harmful. Like you just not generally like using your brain and thinking through things is smart, but yeah, there's so much power in what's out there. And so like, I think we both kind of land on like yeah use an integrative approach when you need to um but i love the power that you can access um you know through natural healing and even through food you know it's amazing it's really cool once you open your mind to that and trust the process but yeah. like you said you know if it worsened your uti you would have went to the doctor yeah. you would have got it whatever and that's huge i think having being flexible, not being like, yes. no, I just need more cranberry. It's like, yes. well, maybe there, there's a time and a place. Yeah. You and, know. and I even to the point where I actually, I was three days in, it was two days before Christmas. I'm like, I'm just going to go get the antibiotics because on Christmas day, I don't want to like right. go to the ER with a kidney infection. <laughs> and so I think, you know, whether you're taking care of your day-to-day -day health or you have an acute situation, you always want to be listening to your body. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something too, that we've all kind of lost base with. <laughs> and so I think that listening to your body, knowing its cues is huge, no matter how you're treating it. Which is great. And then that helps you understand this biochemical individuality, right? Like yes. medicine A might work for Sally, but may not work for Tim or vice right. versa, you know? Right. Um, yeah, really, really great point. But 
do you know, like the pharma, I, I remember reading a stat sometime. It was like 63% or 70% of like all drugs are derived from natural compounds. Do you know the number or isn't it really up no. there? It's really high. It's pretty high. I yeah. don't remember the number. Yeah. I probably had to memorize that number for a test. For something. Like 2007. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of interesting to, to sort of think about, you know, because yeah. it makes sense. You're like, okay, if you, if there's something in nature that has been studied, maybe in like a veterinary journal or whatever, right. some scientist figures out, well, this molecule latches onto this, which inhibits that. Right. So if we know how this molecule is shaped, maybe we can make a synthetic analog right. of that that we can patent and then sell. Like it makes sense that you would screen right. through like high throughput screeners or something. Yes. Well, and I think oftentimes they were found on accident and mm. it's like, oh, all the women maybe in the village hundreds of years ago Maybe when they got a UTI, they were drinking parsley tea and then they realized that it also did something else. Maybe, you know, like maybe it cleared their skin and then, you know, pharma's like, well, that's new acne drug, you know? Mm. And so I think that that was a random, not a real world example, right. but just, I think just humans living their experience and figuring things out. That's, I mean, it was essentially science. It just didn't have a, a name on it. Right. Mm. And that, how they were discovered. Just observation. Yeah. Yeah. There, the interesting story about um, like anti-epileptic drugs and things like that, and then the ketogenic diet, have you dove into that? I haven't. It's just so fascinating to me. And I just had a, a friend, we had um, a barbecue last weekend, so it reminded me of this, Yeah. where you know a lot of people, they will exhaust all of their different anti-epileptic. I think Dilantin was the first one. There's all these different yes. derivatives of that now. And so they'll exhaust every medication possible. And then once that doesn't work for their epilepsy, the doctor will say, well, you can always try a ketogenic oh diet. And they're like, oh, I guess I'm totally. fine. I'll cut out bread and cookies and crackers and I'll like eat more avocados and butter. <laughs> and what do you know? Like their symptoms wow. improve. But it was kind of funny. Like I asked my friend, this was his business partner, like, okay, well, why did you wait? Like, why did you go through all of this? Because he right. had this procedure where when he could feel like a seizure coming on and he would call his wife, he would do a, uh, I am um, not Percocet, but one of these like opioids so that he wouldn't, so the, he had this like routine that he, and yeah. he would ride his bike and all that. And I'm like, okay, so obviously you, you went through all of this. Why don't you just change your diet early on? He's like, yeah. no one told me about it. So it was just like a crazy end totally. of one story. Just to be real, the ketogenic diet is not dependent on a pharmaceutical and, and journals get money from pharmaceutical companies right and so you know like I don't want to always bring it back to that but I mean that is amazing and if there's evidence for that that should be like shouted from the rooftops right um, and that I'm sure that applies to so many other things beyond epilepsy uh, just the simple power of eliminating because not only when you eliminate um, the processed food you're also eliminating like the glyphosate and other things that disrupt the biome that and our gut and our brains are connected so it's like all these layered effects um, just of taking out all the processed foods and the chemicals. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, so you raise your kids on real foods and you guys are outdoors. Mostly. <laughs> well, yeah, sometimes. Keep it real. Yeah. So what would be like, you might get uh, what magic spoon cereal or what would something they like? Yep. Yep. I mean, obviously you, you try to keep it balanced. Like sometimes yeah. we'll buy plantain chips or whatever. Like Totally. Um, yeah. You got to sneak it in, you know, and then they just kind of get used to it. That's mm -hmm. what I found with kids and even myself is you know if it's what's on the table or if it's what's available for snack time like eventually they'll eat it if they're hungry yeah. and then their taste buds kind of adapt and you know what's funny about that is so we we really actually do try to avoid food coloring mm -hmm. so we try to eat mostly real food but we're you know we'll grab a bag of chips that i know has like a seed oil on it sometimes that i know is terrible for us but every now and then that's yeah. just it happens um but with food coloring, I'm like a little bit more picky about it. And so like a month ago, I was like, okay, yeah, you can have it. It's like, sure. Mm -hmm. And my kid, like one of my kids was like, that is gross. He couldn't even finish it. It was wow. like this Minchie's, you know, I mean, it, I tasted, it literally tasted terrible. <laughs> and so I think the reality is, is that as humans, little kids and us, your taste buds adapt to what you're eating. And so my kids are used to my smoothies or, you know, the, just not food coloring, ice cream that we might get for a treat or whatever. And so whether you're them or you're me, whatever you're eating, you're going to want more of it. Mm -hmm. And so I have to remind myself that even with my kids, you know, like I, I give them lots of superfood smoothies. It's a great way for adults and kids to just get in nutrients and they'll drink it because they've adapted to it. But when I don't, and then I introduce it back in, 
it's like they're like, oh, it's so gross. <laughs> mm. So, you know, I think it's just a good lesson for all of us, you know, to eat that, eat real food um, because then you'll want it more. And mm. there's actually science behind that, the gut brain interaction and our taste buds. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that is such a great point. Yeah. I mean, we, we sort of like entrain these different pathways, right? Mm-hmm. So if we're in training the processed food pathway, then the real food tastes like crap. And totally. it's a great way. Yeah. Cause a lot of parents are like, well, I would eat my, I would feed my family healthier food and we would eat better, but my kids just don't like it. And it's like, it's going to take time. Like yeah. you, you, and you, you know, like you said, I mean, let them get hungry and they will eat it. You know, just totally. this is all we have for dinner. Sorry. There's no pasta tonight. It's like, Oh, there's a little whining, but they'll yes, eat it. You know, they will. And yeah, especially if you know, it's like eight o'clock and it's like, well, last call. (laughs) But yeah, I think that's true. And I think that, you know, for kids, they also, they model what we do too. And so I'm always keeping that in my head when it comes to kids and nutrition. For me, I try to approach it like where we keep it fun. We, I try to keep it diverse. And I also allow a little grace because I don't want my kids to go to college and then like eat you know, mac and cheese and pizza only because they're like, my mom made me. <laughs> she restricted too yeah, much. Totally. Yeah. And so I think it's, I think it also helps kids. Like I loved it when I let them eat it. I'm like, yeah, let's try it. And mm-hmm. they, my one kid was like, this is, he did finish it. And so I think that, you know, naturally teaching them like, yeah. And just, I like to teach too. Like, this is why it's not just because I'm a mean mom or mm-hmm. whatever, you know, um, just giving them a little bit of empowerment. I mean, they're still pretty young. So I mean, who knows, but I think over as they grow up, just giving them those tools and those little ideas, you know. It, so. I'm with you. I used to be like, no, we can't have any of that no matter what. Like, it's got to be real food all the time. Yeah. And then I realized that could backfire. And so I've been having more grace. And when we were in Montana, Nez was, we went to a cool coffee shop. And she was like, I really want that croissant, Dad. And I was like, okay, fine, you can have it. And she had half of it. Yeah. And it was like just the white pastry, you know, glazed butter, like yeah. the really bad looking one, but it probably tasted good for a little bit, but she only ate half. And she's like, I don't know. I, like, I, I just, it's too much. And I was totally. like, okay, cool. So now, you know, like you said, if you wait 18 years, then she yeah. goes to college, she's going to be just scarfing it all down like a massive cheat yeah. day. Yeah. So <clears throat> um, you want to have a healthy relationship with food. I'm, I'm with you hundred percent. And it tastes good. So yeah. It's like, What about screens? How do you manage that with your kids? Yeah, you know, well, we actually don't have a TV up, which helps. Um, we put it up in December, Christmas movies and stuff. Cool. Um, but, yeah, we don't have a TV up, so we have an iPad that I'll bust out. And usually my kids just get to watch it if I have something that I have to do for work and if my husband's at work. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of like a, like, I have no other option. What do right. I do with you guys? <laughs> Situation and or, like, kind of like a movie night on Friday night. So, we try not to keep it in any part of the norm. Like it's not part of our routine. And as, I mean, especially in the summer, it's harder in the winter, I would say, um, you know, and it's kind of similar with food. I feel like if I'm like too hardcore about it, then it's like they obsess over it. And mm-hmm. so, um, but yeah, we just get them outside. They have bikes and, you know, all that jazz, hiking and swimming and mm-hmm. so much better for them. Get them dirty. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. Yeah. Isn't it funny being around other parents who are scared of the dirt and, oh my gosh, you got to wash your hands. I like it, it's pretty interesting yeah. to see, um, to see that fear around that. Uh, it's crazy. But Meg, uh, like I said, when we started this, uh, I really admire how you, how you raise your kids and how active they are. They're fishing, you're hiking, you're doing all that. Um, I commend you for your work and I appreciate you coming on uh, kind of the final question that I like to ask a few final questions. Uh, like everyone that we talk to is I know that successful people and we hear successful people have routines and all that. You're a busy mom of three. Is there anything you do like in the morning to kick, kickstart your day? So it's productive and you get accomplished what you want to accomplish. Mm. Yeah, I would like, I kind of use the word rhythm for me. It helps. It gives me a little bit more grace because like with kids, um, there's, there's always something unknown. Even today, like, you know, my husband's neck hurt and threw off my morning a little bit and my, my whole day. And so for me, um, I try to have some time where I'm not actually working or, or eating breakfast or anything. It's just like I'm reading and I have some quiet time. But what, something that's new for me actually is getting outside first thing in the morning mm-hmm. um, when we can. It actually really, ch- I did that in Hawaii and it just, com- I completely changed my days. And so I'm working on that. I'm actually going to put my chair outside instead of inside for that morning time. Um, but something that I don't know if this is helpful for you or for anybody else, but I have found myself to be disappointed. Like I'm like not doing a routine or not doing a rhythm. And something that I do is I just bring my kids along with me. So the Mm. other day my kids were going crazy and I wanted to go for a run and I could tell one of my sons didn't want to just stay home with dad and like read or play in the yard. I was like, okay, you get on your mountain bike 
and we're both going to go work out. Nice. And so for me, I've kind of learned to intertwine it into my life and I just keep it simple. And so I just know that what helps me feel well is when I'm eating well, when I'm taking care of myself and when as a family, we're kind of operating in that, in that healthy space, we all just thrive better. And also when I'm intentional with community for me, that's huge. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know, I don't really have like a magic bullet trick for me. I guess my recommendation would be don't wait for some sort of perfect routine to like show up in your life to, cause for me, real life, especially with kids is like, it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kids wake up at different times. Like all of a sudden your kid's awake and you thought they'd be asleep. So it's like, okay, come join me. We're, I'm going to do this bar while you're reading a book in the chair. And so bars like a workout. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, I think for me, the flexibility and just keeping it simple and just doing it no matter what it looks like has been the best for me. That's key. And then, like you said, incorporating your children into it, yeah. you know, because I think a lot of people say, well, I just don't have time to exercise because I have kids and I have this. It's like, make them part of it that it, they can, when they see they, they role model and they want to impress oh, yeah. you and all that, like they want to get on the bike faster or they want to run with you or do whatever. Yeah. You may not get the best workout, but at least you're getting something totally. and you're doing it together. Yeah. That's, that's huge. That's a great tip. Yeah. Awesome, Meg. And now you're doing coaching as well for people. Well, I don't accept clients yet. I'm okay. thinking once my kids have more, once they actually will have a routine starting in the fall and I have time, uh, then I'm looking forward to that. Right now I'm just kind of sharing my heart and my passion awesome. on Instagram. And I'm actually going to wrap up my integrative health practitioner, um, the second level of it, so that I can offer labs and stuff. Cool. Yeah. That's really great. Now, do you see yourself going back to doing like retail pharmacy or pharmacy in any regard or are you kind of... No, you know, um, I actually, I never worked in a pharmacy and I worked kind of high level at a systems level and I feel like I kind of peaked out there, you know, I mean, it was good while it lasted. I learned, I had an insight into an area that I would have never, ever seen into to that degree that actually inspired me to, for a more integrative holistic approach. But yeah, I think for me, I just love empowering people to create their health I mean, even outside of pharmaceuticals and save those for when you need them. But I think there's such a need. It's not on the news to mm -hmm. how to create your health. And so that's kind of, that's the passion of mine. Good for you. That's awesome. Yeah. What's your Instagram handle so people can check you out? Yeah, it's a whole health life. It's kind of a mouthful. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. You have really great stuff. And then for people that want to get into hiking, you have a lot of good stuff. Like you go out with your girls and you guys are camping for a couple days at a time. How often do you do that? Yeah. Well, in the summer, a lot. So we're actually gearing up for our first road trip. And yeah, we haven't done a ton of backpacking with our kids. But yeah, I'm about to do like a summary on what we put in our backpack, like emergency and all mm. that. So cool. yeah, it's a big part of our life. But. It's awesome. It's huge. It's been so fun to uh, to do that now with our nine year old who can yeah. do it with us, which is great. So Meg, thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing great information. Well, Mike, I didn't get a chance to thank you. <laughs> thanks for having me. I for mean, sure. honestly, we we connected on Instagram, I don't know, six months ago or something yeah. and live close ish to each other. So it's just been so fun to meet you and to get to talk in person. It's always better. <laughs> thank you. I agree. hundred percent. Well, my friend, thank you for tuning all the way to the end. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Meg. I will put links to her Instagram handle and some of the research and show notes that we talked about. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can leave us a little bit of uh, feedback or a review over on iTunes. That goes a long way. You can also share this over on Instagram. My handle is metabolic underscore Mike, and I will put Meg's handle uh, in the show notes as well. And if you're over here on YouTube and you're still here, please hit that like button and thank you for still being here. And we will catch you on a future episode down the road. Have an awesome rest of your day.